Hello, I'm Bob Brasher, very proud part-time curator of the Hall of Fame. Recently, the Hall of Fame and our entire field lost a true hero, Dr. Abraham Nemeth. Many of us have our personal and professional memories of this larger-than-life hero and 2005 Hall of Fame inductee. One of our board members wrote the other day, uh, Mike Cole, his personal reflections. He says, I was in the fifth grade when we were told that our old math books were going away, replaced by new ones. At first, we were surprised, but kids are very good at just saying, it looks different. And it was. I mean, no number signs. I was thrilled, like meeting a superstar, when Nimeth was honored with the Creative Use of Braille Award at the annual meeting in 2001. He was funny and quite approachable, someone who made an enormous contribution. I remember him saying that he, was, he wasn't a transcriber, just a physics student looking to make his life easier. Ah, but he had the discipline to carry the system through to a full notation code. I'm so, so glad and proud that we honored him. Let's take a moment of silence for Dr. Nemeth. Thank you. Now setting the tone for this wonderful Hall of Fame induction ceremony, you should know or you should recall that the Hall was initially announced to you at the annual meeting in 2001. In 2002, we enjoyed the first induction, honored to have with us nine of the ten living legends. They were here and they shared their stories. Uh, it was an amazing evening, uh, evoking a lot of laughter and a lot of tears. From 2002 through this year, 2013, we honor 52 worthy heroes in this noble venture. Please also keep in mind that this is your Hall of Fame, and it's totally supported by you and your donations. Our board is voluntary. Our continued operation is based solely on donations primarily raised by the handsomely engraved stones on the wall of tribute. There are at this time, 180 stones on the wall, honoring mentors, friends, legends, and organizations that touch your lives. Uh, I think there's a picture coming up of Dr. Gideon Jones of FSU fame with his, his stone, and that is now up and installed in the Hall of Fame on the wall of tribute. Stones of various sizes are donated by individuals, by groups, campaigns, by agencies, and it's easier than ever now with the new online process, and no, you do not have to be a PayPal uh, member to donate. <laughs> online or by check or phone, you can make a donation to aid in sponsoring several of our inductees' bas relief plaques. You can order a stone or enter a donation towards a stone campaign, or you can simply make a donation to support the hall, and it's all tax deductible. Look at those uh, plaques up there, if you could go back to those two wonderful plaques. Uh, one artist has sculpted all 52 of our plaques in the Hall of Fame, and that artist is Andrew Dakin. Andrew, if you're here, would you please stand? Very. It's amazing work. The hall, it's yours. We thank you for continuing to support it. It does keep getting better, both online as we continue to add content, like the terrific interviews that Mike Bina is providing with our living legends, already up, or Bill English, Phil Hatlin, Dean Tuttle, and soon to come, he says, is a real uh, wing dinger, and that's with Alice Raftery. So we'll look forward to that. Um, Let's take a moment, if we can now, to acknowledge two of our living legends that are with us this evening. 2002 inductee, Alice Raftery. Alice. And 2008 inductee, Dr. Rick Welch. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Members of the Voluntary Board able to be with us this evening include Janie Blome, Roseanne Silberman, 
Diane Wormsley, along with past chair Kay Holbrook, and we thank you all for being with us as well. And finally, the chair of the Board of Governors, Dr. Jane Aaron, has asked that I extend a welcome to all of you as we recognize two new inductees to the Hall of Fame. She's unable to attend this year due to a, a family event, but she joins us in honoring the important work of Dr. Lawrence Jones and Ms. Martha Fox. Jane's words to you. It was an extraordinary privilege to participate in the selection of the two inductees whose efforts led the way for education for many young black children with visual impairments who previously had no educational opportunities. For all of us in the profession, this occasion is a reminder that success is not always achieved in conventional ways. The truly exceptional people in our field did not reach their goals by following a well-paved road. Pioneers like Dr. Jones and Ms. Fox recognized that the routes to some destinations are not clearly marked. They built the roads that allowed others to more easily reach their destinations. I'm humbled by the wisdom of Dr. Jones in his quest to involve others in the establishment of opportunities for children, and by the strength and persistence of Ms. Fox in leading her students into a world of learning. Even though I cannot be present at tonight's ceremony, I join you in honoring two people who exemplify the reasons why we continue to believe in the importance of the educational opportunities for everyone. And that's from Jane Aaron, and we appreciate her. Now to lead us forward and set the stage at the Piney Woods School uh, will be B.J. Lejeune. So I'm turning it to B.J. Thank you so much. South of Jackson lies a deeply wooded section known as the Piney Woods. There are a few rays of light that come through the trees, but after the Civil War, it was a place of poverty, distrust, and hopelessness. In 1909, Lawrence Jones, a recent graduate from the University of Iowa, stepped off the train and walked down a dusty road, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> I knew I wouldn't be able to do this, <laughs> through the heart of the Piney Woods, carrying only a clean shirt, a few clean shirts, a Bible, a couple of textbooks, a diploma, and a dollar and 65 cents. With little more than a dream and a simple faith in following God's call, he started the Piney Woods Country Life School to educate the sons and daughters of impoverished sharecroppers. Against all odds, including racism, tornadoes, financial woes, and an attempted lynching, the rope actually placed around his neck, he succeeded. Dr. Jones, known as the Little Professor of Piney Woods, held firm to his head, heart, and hands philosophy that addressed educating the mind, developing good, strong character based on spiritual values, and required students to develop three skills by which they could support themselves, one that they could do very well. Many students came down that Piney Woods road and arrived at the campus in a mule-drawn wagon loaded with vegetables and goods for their tuition, driven by parents filled with hope. The Piney Woods School is alive and well today and one of only four residential boarding schools for Afro-American students. At one time, there were over 100 such, student, such schools. Excuse me. The early days were very challenging. The school started under a cedar tree with one inquiring student who brought another. Many students were involved in the building of the school, actually building the school, working the gardens and livestock farm to feed the students. It was important to win the support of the white community but many were troubled by the idea that somebody that was black was learning to read and write. Dedicated staff often stayed at the school and worked for little or no salary. Many supporters from all over the country, both black and white, supported the work of building the Piney Woods School. The school supported the community of helping local farmers, black and white, and building goodwill along with building the school. Two events impacted the Piney Woods for the future of Afro-American students who were blind. Dr. Jones found a young blind girl in Vicksburg begging on the side of the street. And then Robert Chandler, a young blind boy whose sharecropper parents died in a fire, came down that road to the Piney Woods School. Dr. Jones took him in and could not help but feel there should be more for those who were blind. At the urging of Senator Adams from Mississippi, Dr. Jones was able to enter into a government agreement to educate blind students who were black. After looking all over the country, Jones found Martha Louise Fox, then known as Martha Louise Morrow, 
a recent graduate from the Overbrook School for the Blind in Philadelphia. She came to Mississippi in 1929, and the <clears throat> School for the Colored Blind opened on the Piney Woods campus. And by the end of that first summer, there were 10 students enrolled. Miss Morrow came down that road bringing innovative teaching practices, Braille, and a hope to the Piney Woods. She pioneered a new pirate paradigm for teaching, a classroom without walls, if you will. Her motto was learn by doing. She did not just teach skills, she taught a way of life. Blind students were expected to develop by skills by which they could support themselves, including hand stitching, basket weaving, piano tuning, caning chairs, and many black and white teachers came to the Piney Woods School to learn their teaching practices. Supporters came from around the world, including Helen Keller. The Piney Woods School was established by, on the premise that everyone worked. When the Great Depression hit, the school lost all its state funding, but Dr. Jones did not give up. They started an aggressive effort to keep the school alive. Blind students performed with sighted students in a group known as the Cotton Blossom Singers. When you came in initially, you might have heard some of the musicians from the Piney Woods School performing. Uh, some students, uh, some worked in music groups that toured the United States to raise funds for the school, traveling in and out of the Piney Woods in one of the first sleep-in travel buses. You think that's a new phenomenon for music groups. These groups included the very popular, and if you haven't heard them, please look them up on YouTube, International Sweethearts of Rhythm, the first integrated women's swing band from the 30s and 40s, and the Five Blind Boys of Mississippi, who, I'm sorry, were before the Five Blind Boys from Alabama, uh, the most well-known of those traveling groups. By the 1940s, blind children participated fully in the school's activities, becoming valued members of the Piney Woods community. And that was what Dr. Jones and Ms. Fox, really, their real legacy to the blind. They pioneered some of the first programs to mainstream blind students. We're talking the 1940s, folks. <clears throat> blind students were fully integrated into the Piney Woods High School. The success of this experiment forever changed the stigma of blindness for those who participated. In the 1950s, the Mississippi Negro Blind School was moved from Piney Woods to Jackson as a separate institution where Ms. Fox served as the principal and lead teacher for 20 years. In 1974, the Mississippi School for the Blind integrated campus opened in Jackson, Mississippi. The journey towards a top-notch education for the blind in Mississippi continues, but it had its beginnings at the Piney Woods School. Both Ms. Fox and Dr. Jones lived to see this dream come true, although they both passed away shortly following. Although no longer housing the School for the Blind, the road to the Piney Woods School is, <coughs> is still well-traveled as one of four residential preparatory schools for Afro-American students in the country and attracts students from all over the world. I wasn't able to find recent um, numbers, but in the 2010 graduating class averaged $52,000 in scholarships for every student that graduated and went to college. Today, the Mississippi School for the Blind still uses many of Mrs. Fox's teaching methods and strategies to teach diverse and exuberant student body. You may be using them too. Please join me in showing your appreciation for all who helped build the Piney Woods School into an exemplary education program. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening sky. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Although these words were penned by James Weldon Johnson, originally released as a poem in the year 1900 in honor of President Abraham Lincoln's birthday, later set to music and now affectionately known as the National Anthem for African Americans. The lyrics are a great backdrop for tonight's occasion. The joy reflected by this author's words parallels the joy we feel tonight as Martha Louise Morrow Fox is one of this year's Hall of Fame inductees. Her life is a living testimony of tenacity, faith, perseverance, and hope. The road to her induction into this prestigious arena of legends and leaders in the field of blindness is nothing short of a miracle, too. 
Martha was born to Frank and Hattie Morrow in Charlotte, North Carolina, October 9, 1902. She was a student at the Governor Moorhead School for the Blind until her family moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1917. Then Martha became a student at the Overbrook School and she graduated in 1927. Following her graduation, she enrolled at Temple University and the University of Pennsylvania. At the conclusion of her first year, she was recruited to move to Mississippi to work at the Piney Woods Country Life School to teach students in the Department of the Blind on the campus of Piney Woods School. After making this career decision, personal schooling for Martha had to be rearranged. She enrolled at several colleges during the summer months. She studied at the University of Wisconsin, West Virginia State College, and Hampton Institute, where she earned her Bachelor of Science degree in education. Dr. Lawrence Jones, founder of Piney Woods School, added a department to educate black blind students in the 1920s, as you've already heard. Prior to that, there was no formal education for black blind students in the state of Mississippi. After the state created the Commission for the Blind in 1928, Martha was hired in April 1929. On May 6, 1929, the Department for the Blind on the campus of the Piney Woods Country Life School opened. Martha was not only the teacher, she was also the housemistress. She was responsible for their personal care, medical attention, residential needs, and certainly their educational needs. In 1937, Martha married Mr. Alexander Fox. Mrs. Fox helped to ensure that her students were afforded the same experiences as their sighted counterparts at Piney Woods School. Martha taught all of the blind students in grades one through eight. However, blind students in grades 9 through 12 attended classes with their sighted peers at Piney Woods. The school formed music groups that toured and performed to help provide needed financial support for the school. Dr. Jones asked Mrs. Fox to organize blind quartets. Some of Mrs. Fox's students who performed in these groups became part of the legendary singing group, as already has been mentioned, the Five Blind Boys of Mississippi. Mrs. Fox's teaching philosophy embraced the concept of learning outside of the walls of the classroom and incorporating nature into her lessons. The curriculum Mrs. Fox designed was a forerunner of the present day expanded core curriculum. She believed in hands-on teaching learning, community-based lessons, independent living, braille, the arts, work experience, and vocational opportunities. She believes students should be taught skills that would enable them to be self-sufficient and contributing citizens to society after graduation. Her motto was, you learn by doing. Along with the basic core academic curriculum, the vocational curriculum included such things as chair caning, broom making, sewing, piano tuning, shoe making, rug making, and industrial arts. In 1945, Helen Keller, visited the Piney Woods School and appeared before the Mississippi State Legislature, appealing for funds to educate black blind students. In 1948 and 1950, two new schools for blind students were built in Jackson, Mississippi. A school for black students was built on the Capers campus, and a school for white students was built on the Eastover Drive campus. Martha Fox was named principal for the school serving black students the Mississippi School for the Blind Capers Division. She served in that capacity through May 1969. Some of her honors include the FDR Dr uh, Drama Award and the Mississippi Teacher Association Outstanding Teacher Award. Mrs. Fox, legacy of being a pioneer, innovative educator, trailblazer, master teacher, trainer of teachers, committed leader should be remembered and applauded. She departed on September 1985. As we reflect and celebrate the impact Martha Fox has made on countless lives during tonight's induction ceremony, continue in the words of Johnson, and I quote, sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope 
that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won, end quote. Let us march on till victory is won for all of those we serve, just as Martha Fox did. How you all doing? My name is Napoleon Campbell. And um, 2001, we had a school reunion and we visited Piney Woods and asked questions at Piney Woods at that time. And no one could answer those questions about Department for the Blind, and I did research. And it gives me great honor over these last 12 years where I have learned who Ms. Fox was from day one until she died. And her life is so significant to us because at those, during those times and in Mississippi, it was so difficult. And she fought the odds for all of us. And she taught all of us. And it gives me a special great feeling because when I first came to the school, I was so bad. She told everybody I was untamed. I didn't have no training. <laughs> I ran, made up a lot of noise and everything. And this was in 62. And I met her my last, the last seven years of her career at the school. And in studying her and, and appreciating her life, I can only say for her in this way, that one, she would first thank God for giving her the strength to do what she did. Secondly, she would thank Senator Adam for the finance and the political juice. Thirdly, she would thank Dr. Jones twice. One, for giving her, giving the school a place to be. And secondly, in 32, when she lost, when there was no money, he told her, hang in here, don't worry about it. Whatever we have to do, we'll keep the school going. And from that point, she kept going. Anytime things got rough, times were hard, Dr. John supported her, and he kept her going. In 42, she and Mrs. Addie McBride, she would thank Miss Addie McBride as well, because when Adams died and the Division for the Blind was created, a welfare department, Miss Addie McBride was there and she still gave Miss Fox support. When the Mississippi industry started, six of Mrs. Fox students were out of the first 12 that started the Mississippi industry for the blind. Over those 40 years, guesstimated 400, 200 children probably passed through the school. Through that same period of time, at least 50 students went to college and probably 35 of them graduated. And out of that 35, there's one lawyer and several master degrees and a whole bunch of BS degrees that came through her. So, what she did, uh, we are so proud and we're so happy that she did do that. And the only thing I can say for Ms. Fox is right on. And I would love to, I'm glad to thank APH because number one, you all gave the, the Division for the Blind, Department for the Blind at Piney Woods book support from 1929 until 1969 that all of her years HPH was there in one form or another. So first, I would like to thank you for doing that. And secondly, I truly want to thank you for her, myself, and giving me the special honor 
that you all put her in the Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Napoleon. <clears throat> the theme from the first night of the conference here has been, for those of you who haven't been here, kind of like water flowing down. In my mind, when I think about the Heinywood School, I think of a dusty road. Needed that water. Dr. Jones and Ms. Fox was wa were water. The Heinywood School, as we know, was founded in 1909. Think about what things were like in 1909. Uh, as you look at the logo of the Piney School, there is a, a box, and there's a tree in the box, but the tree is growing out of its boundaries. And as that tree grows out, so did Dr. Jones think outside the, the box um, in his approach to education. His task of founding the school was difficult, and he was almost lynched for his efforts. Apparently, jo Dr. Jones was quite persuasive, uh, and when I had mentioned before, there was an attempted uh, lynching. Um, the man who put the noose around his neck asked him if he had any final words. And he gave them and shared with them his vision for the school. And the man that put the noose around his neck took it off, gave him five dollars, and passed the plate. Basically turning a lynching into a fundraiser. <laughs> Don't you want him on your board? <clears throat> he is one of only eight people recorded to have survived a lynching in the United States. And this is indi an indication of his passion and his persuasive, charismatic personality. The school was started with one 16-year-old student, and it grew. They moved from the, the tree, uh, the cedar tree, which unfortunately has lost its life, um, to a donated sheep shed. And many of the children and grandchildren of slaves who themselves had never learned to read came to the Pineywood School. All students at the, the school, as I mentioned before, were required to work, um, helping to grow the school and to take care of uh, the students that were there. And um, Dr. Jones was a tough taskmaster. Uh, I spoke to more than one person whose parents had threatened them if they didn't straighten up, they were going to the Pineywood School. <laughs> in fact, when I was working on my PowerPoint, the lady that cleans our building came in and she saw it on the, my computer monitor and she said, I'm gonna send my daughter there. Uh, <laughs> get her straightened out quick. Um, believing that every child deserved an opportunity, Dr. Jones added the education of blind children to the school in 1929. The State Commission for the Blind, as you've heard, supported the school for a few years, paying a teacher's salary, which, by the way, was about $40 a month, um, until there were no more funds available to support it. The Depression, World War I, during those whole years, but Dr. Jones replied, the Pineywood School is a place where boys and girls can work their way through. Why can't I give blind boys and girls the same opportunity? Like all the other children at the school, the children who were blind or had low vision were expected to work. They had to get out there and do things. Dr. Jones felt that productivity was essential for developing a sense of self and to become a vital and contributing part of the community. He felt it was especially important for those who were blind to learn a skill or a trade. This was a concept well before its time. They were heavily involved in the music program, as we mentioned, uh, boys and girls quartet singing, and they were known as the Cotton Blossom Singers. The music groups and the working teams provided the primary support for the Department of the Blind from 1932 to 1940. The students learned a lot in those years about self-sufficiency, about independence, about personal achievement. In the ninth grade, they were integrated in to the regular high school. Um, there were readers that were in the high school students that would help them to participate fully in the classes. And in the early years of main mainstreaming, there were three who were in the National Honor Society and several graduated with honors and went on to attend college. To support the school, Dr. Jones toured the country himself, telling people of his work and inviting many national and international dignitaries to come visit the campus. And again, he advocated for education that touched the mind, the heart, and where students learn to use their hands. A holistic approach, we call it now. The Pineywood School is no longer serving students who are blind. 
but its mission continues. Dr. Jones appeared in 1956 on a program some of you may remember called This Is Your Life. Ralph Edwards, remember that? He was so moved by Dr. Jones and the story, and I think it is interesting that apparently Dr. Jones had never watched the program on TV until he was in the audience and they brought him up, so it was, uh, I thought that was interesting. But, doc, but um, Ralph Edwards asked everyone who, the viewers, said everybody send in a dollar to support the work of the Pineywood School. And $700,000 was collected, which is the beginning of an endowment for the Pineywood School. And when Dr. Jones died, this, the, enrollment, the endowment had grown to about $7 million. Where the children of former slaves once learned to read, the school is now training leaders for the new millennium. Each building tells a story of the struggle to give young people the opportunity to live extraordinary lives. Dr. Jones received a lot of honors. The University of Iowa named him as one of the university's 10 most outstanding alumni. He's a recipient of the 1970 Silver Buffalo Award from the Boy Scouts of America, which is given to people who have a national impact on youth. In his award, he was referred to as an author and the servant of youth. He received an honorary master's degree from Tuskegee College, and he received five honorary doctorates from Clark University, now known as Mississippi College, Bucknell University, Cornell College, University of uh, Dubuque, and Otterburn College in Westboro, Ohio. I think it's interesting that these represent a secular, a Baptist, a Methodist, and a Presbyterian school. He was everywhere. <laughs> uh, Dr. Jones was an amazing man, and I'm struck by the sacrifices and the commitment that he demonstrated. With a sense of mission and calling, Dr. Jones came to that wild and dark piney woods to start a work which, which, which lit the torch that was passed to others to guarantee the education of young blind children of color as well as sighted students. Dr. Jones's torch, Dr. Jones was the head of the Piney Wood School for 60 years and the glow of that torch touched many lives around the country and his legacy is that he led the way for so many. It's my pleasure to honor and to recognize his achievements and the legacy of this outstanding educator, Dr. Lawrence C. Jones. And I'm particularly honored that his grandson, Lawrence C. Jones III, is here to share some comments with us. Well, thank you, BJ. Um, we've all heard now about uh, Lawrence C. Jones, and uh, I am the last one in that group, uh, being Lawrence C. Jones III. Grandfather founded the school in 1909, but in 1912, he had the fortune of running into a young woman in Vicksburg, Mississippi, who was blind, and grandfather felt that that was her major problem, her only problem. And he had founded a school that basically was to look at problems and to look at people and look beyond their problems and to offer those with a tiny chance in life improvement and a greater chance. And that's <clears throat> that is in fact what he dedicated and devoted his life to and my grandmother devoted her life to with him. Uh, he married her in 1912, my grandmother that is, um, and brought the young blind child back from Vicksburg to the campus and she became one of our first blind students. In 1929, if you've already heard, um, Mrs. Fox joined our campus and uh, we had a series of um, blind students that entered thereafter, uh, after the first group had come in. Um, in 1932, the state saw fit to discontinue funding blind student education in Mississippi, which they started up again in 1940, at the beginning of the war. Um, but uh, in that period, um, State Senator uh, Jesse Adams was uh, very key in providing legislative support 
and moral support uh, to us uh, to continue our dedication to our mission and to our mission with the blind. Um, I'm proud to be here. Um, I know that my cousins who are also uh, here in the back of the room are proud and happy to be here. Uh, we represent the two sons of Lawrence and Grace Jones. Um, and uh, I wanna thank uh, the Publishing Academy and uh, their trustees for having given my grandfather and Mrs. Fox this honor. Um, I'm sorry that none of them, neither of them rather, could be here, but um, their descendants are, and we are very happy and very proud uh, to accept this award. Thank you. I think there's some genes going on there, <laughs> passed on down. Um, I also would like to recognize um, Barbara Hadnot, who's over at the far end of the room. Barbara, would you stand up? Barbara is another one of uh, Ms. Fox's former students, and she wrote a letter of support, and I just want to thank her for being with us. And so many of the Fox family, I mean the uh, Jones family that came, we just thank you so much for coming tonight. And now Tuck. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you, BJ and Rosie, for those wonderful presentations. And Mr. Jones and, and uh, Mr. Campbell for, for your wonderful comments. Um, thank you to the families of both Dr. Jones and Ms. Fox. We're indebted to those two amazing individuals. And this was a... This was the um, yeah, this was the most moving uh, Hall of Fame presentation of which I've been a part. So thank you all.